support the roof frames. So the next thing we had to do is that we had to have a pre-roof checklist. Well, we got that done, but we're not ready for that pre-roof inspection. Because that roof is what? It's a membrane, okay? It's a membrane. It is a waterproof substance that is doing what? Keeping water out of the building. Okay. One of the number one reasons to build a building is to keep the water outside and us inside, okay? That goes back to when man was in a cave. Okay? Nobody likes to be cold and wet, okay? So, David Pitts, number one callback right now is what? Doors. Doors. Number two. Uh, electrical. Number three. Plumbing. <laughs> Four. Roof. Roof. Okay. Used to be roof. Used to be roof. You, roof used to be number one. It's now down number five. Okay. That happened for a reason. Is that the material? No, that's, that was inspections. It was inspections and planning caused that. Okay, what are the six P's? Proper planning prevents piss poor performance. Performance. Will you repeat the name of that book for Richmond, Virginia? They have the request. Which book is that? The Steel Book. The American Institute of Steel Construction Steel Handbook. You can get it on Amazon, uh, you get used ones. And they have different colors, uh, a book, uh, I learned on the blue book, I think the black book is the right book now, I don't know what it is anymore, so. but uh, you had a red one? Yeah, red is probably the latest, right? Well, what did you have in college? The red Okay, we'll call it. We'll say the red one's right. Use a red book. Okay. The only difference between one book and the other is as steel designs get better and better, and rolling theory gets better and better and all that kind of stuff. They come out with new handbooks. Okay. We, I learned on 36 KSIST. Okay, I think y'all are using 50 now. Yeah, so it's just a matter of staying current. From a, from a practical side, from a constructability point of view, dimensions are what you need, right? Dimensions are what you need because we know, and I'm going to, before we get to this roof, we know that we've established a finished floor elevation around the perimeter of the shop, okay, and we know we're going to measure up to whatever bearing we have. We're going to measure up to where our deck bearing elevation is, we know how tall that is, we know where our joist bearing elevations are, we know where our truss girder elevations are. So you're going to get on a dimension, you'll look back here, you'll have 15, 11 and a half, I think is what it shows over here, okay, yeah. top of steel, right? 14 foot top of steel, so you're sloping down the hill. You see that? So you got to know if you're showing top of steel at 15, 11 and a half, you need to know how thick a joist seat is, right? And you got to get that from project manager or from the shop drawings, okay? Truss girders, general rule of thumb, joists are two and a half inches, truss girders are five and a half, and sometimes they're six and a half, sometimes they're seven and a half, depends on the truss girder. You got an idea on the beams, right? That W16, yeah, that W16, which frames into this wall here, you know you got a joist bearing there, and that's 14, what? 14 foot zero, is that correct? 14 0 top of steel. Okay, so if that's 14 0 top of steel, we know from looking at the steel handbook that's 15 and 3 quarter inches. Somebody subtract, take 14 foot. Subtract one foot, three and three quarters. Twelve eight and a quarter. Let's see. That's twelve eleven and a quarter, isn't it? No. no. Eight. Twelve eight. There you go. Thank you. That's good. Okay. So you know to get up to that bearing to the top of that plate, you're going to build into that wall and measure from your finished floor up, and you've got your point set. Okay. Part of your quality control effort. Okay. Your batter boards where you're building, right? When you start it, then the building becomes the building. Always transfer, finish floor. Always understand the point, your key point to lay out from. Okay. Theater construction, when you're inside of a theater, you lay from the back wall out toward the screen, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, not from the screen back. Okay, 
dimensions could be wrong. You have to know where to run your, your dimensions wild. I call it wild dimensions. You always have play in a building, okay? We can generally build a building within an eighth or a quarter of an inch, but invariably you need to know where to lose our game, okay? What fractions you have. Am I making sense here? So this particular building, this shop, you're going to lay the shop out from back to front. Okay, you're going to lay it out from back to front. You're going to get that back wall in place. You're going to have these anchor bolts in place, but you're going to have everything going from back to front. If you go from front to back, you may end up with bad dimensions because the architectural details as a general rule are going to be wrong on the front of that building. Architects are going to make mistakes. So you've got to work off the center line of your anchor bolts and everything <clears throat> on that face that works from the center line of your anchor bolts out. Am I making sense here? So that's part of the things you learn in your quality and assurance program, okay, which is part of your, your, your pre-scheduling. Do I understand how this building goes together? Okay, big question. Do I understand it? If I don't understand it, do I let things just happen? No. Okay. The worst thing you can do is to guess. Okay. And if you guys are ever criticized by anybody in this outfit for asking a question, okay, and I'm not talking a little kidding around kind of stuff. If you ever get criticized for that, I want to hear about it. All right? Because you should never be criticized for wanting to do a good job and for not understanding what you're supposed to do. That's a horrible character trait that someone would have if they would criticize you for asking a question. Sorry, I'm on my soapbox. Back to the point. <coughs> Back to the point. Okay, so we're on our roof. We're on our roof. And so, metal back's on. And so we need, we said we need to have roof curves, right? Right? Yes. yes. Okay. What else do we need? <coughs> All right, let's look at our plans. Let's go to our architectural plans. Okay, let's look at 2A1.1. This section, this section, this section. 2A, there we go. Alright, look at this one, this one, and that one. Look at the assumptions. Okay, what we want to look at is this section, this section, and this section. Okay. So you go to sheet 2A6.2, detail 3, 2A6.2, detail 4, and detail 5. Section five. Okay. 
you're looking at is the Okay, there's the rear sidewalk, there's the inside, there's the roof. Okay, so what we want to look at. What section? Let's do the bottom line. So, when we cut that section, once again, we're getting ready for the roof, right? We're getting ready for the roof. When we cut through the rear wall section, what kind of blocking or roof nail do we have to have? Okay. So let's call that roof blocking, right? Is the steel erector going to do your roof blocking? No. 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 Okay. How are they fastened? Fastened. <coughs> fastened. Grommet. Okay. They got a two by. Let's see. Now that pre-finished metal drip edge is actually part of the roof. Okay. And so they're really not giving us a detail on how to fasten that, are they? Uh, they're just kind of saying make sure it works. So we're, let's just call it fasteners, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. And we know that the rest of what's shown there is by the roofer. The roofer's going to do the gutter. He's going to do the downspout. He's going to do the drip edge, right? He's going to do the roof insulation and the roof membrane. All right, let's look at section three. Come down just a little bit here, Darcy. Thank you. All right, there we go. Now, what is this called from here up? Parapet. Parapet, very good. All right, what do we have to have before we can run that roof up there? Okay, well, bottom beam's already in. Basin's already done that, right? So what's on top of that parapet? Up here, you got a two-by? Three-quarter plywood. Okay, you got some blocking and some three-quarter plywood, right? Okay? Right? You see that? And you got some fasteners. Okay, so now let's take a look. Let's go back to our front sheet again to our floor plan. And let's look at 2G2A6.1 two, detail 2. obviously the front parapet, right? Everybody with me? Okay, that roof membrane comes, metal deck ties up the steel framing, and then it goes up. So what do we have to have right here? Okay, so we got to have metal studs, right? What's on top of the metal studs? Alright, got the deck, right? Do you have a roof nailer? At the top? Hell yeah. See that? Same kind of detail, plywood and blocking. Everybody see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's start talking about trades. Who's the roof curb come from? 
No, sir. Uh, HVAC. HVAC, right? Yes, sir. Rooftop unit, HVAC on a public roof curves come from public. Who does the roof blocking and the fasteners? Frame. Frame. Car Framer. Carpenter, right? Who does the metal studs? Framer. 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 Let's just call that metal stud man. Okay? Who does the den stack on top of that? Same for Same one. Frank, if it was plied, it would be done by the carpenter, right? So you, you know from going over your subcontracts with your project manager which subcontractor is responsible for which piece of work, right? You get a copy of the subcontracts, it has R1, and there it is. So let's schedule, let's see what the schedule looks like. Okay. Our first activity up at the top is roof curtains, right? Roof curtains. And that can start here and go to here. Why can you start at exactly the same time? Because we're going to get the curb. Curb's here. We've already, everything's here. Okay? Parapet wall. Parapet wall. So you got metal studs. <coughs> Sheathing. Okay? What's your next activity that you could be doing? Roof blocking. Roof blocking. Okay. Are any of those activities dependent on the other? You yes. have to do one before you have to do the other. Yes. Okay, tell me where that is. Uh, the framer's got to build a parapet wall before the blocking goes up. That's right. That's right. Now let's look at that detail just a little bit closer. Okay. All right, I see a parapet there. Okay. But what do I see it just under that blocking? What does it say? Steel beam. Steel beam. You see that? So do I really need to have that metal stud up? Not really. Not really. Okay. This is where you coordinate your details. Okay. We've got steel that is actually supporting the blocking and the metal studs on this thing's infill, but you're exactly right. A lot of times you have a parapet wall go up, you gotta have that wall before you put the neighbors on. Okay? You gotta you got sheath it too though. So yep. the blocking has to be set. Well, you know, you know how thick your, your sheathing is. So I'm not saying, you know, as a practical matter, you're probably going to let the guy sheath up, okay? But are they truly dependent on each other? No, they're not. Each one of these activities could run at the same time if we wanted them to, right? So, how long is it going to take to set the roof curves? How many days? Just guess. Two days. One day. Okay. If we were to take off that 100 feet of metal stud and drywall that's going on the front, Let's just for the sake of conversation say that they've got to put those studs in at 16 inches on center, okay, 15 feet high, lots of footage there, right? So we know we've got to do that. So let's just say for the sake of conversation, metal studs and drywall take 10 days, okay? Roof blocking and curbing, roof blocking, you're also going to have some, some blocking overall where you tie in next to the public on this particular thing. We know that 100 and 170 is 340, so we got 340 feet of blocking, okay? I'm just going to put 340 as a quantity. And let's just say for the sake of conversation, that takes three days. Somebody do, uh, you got your calculator, John. Uh, give me 100 divided by 1.33. Give me 75 by 20, 1,500. Okay, you got 1,700 feet of studs, roughly, 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 roughly. Please don't write this in anything other than pencil. Feet of stud and track to run. And we know that parapet is about how high up from the deck up to the top? Four foot. How many? Four foot eight. Four foot eight. 
five, five foot times 100 is 500 square feet of sheathing, right? Okay, so intuitively you would know that the metal stud guy on this activity to get ready, ready for the roof is what? The critical path. Do you see that? Why? That's three days. That's 10 days. That's one day. Early start. Early start is 9.30. Early finish is what? 10 10. 10 10. 10 10. See, I always use September. 30 days has September. That way I don't have to subtract one. Okay. All right. What's my late start? 9.30. Yep. What's my late finish? 10 10. Okay. Definition of critical path is what? The longest path. The longest path through the schedule. When the early start and early finish and late start and late finish are the same, that is your critical path. <coughs> okay? So, back to the practical side. Okay? You got your, 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 your steel frame up. You got your masonry walls up. Okay? Masonry walls are almost up. Who are you going to be calling first? Metal stud guy. Hey, man, you got your metal studs secured? You got those ordered? We're in Live Oak, Florida, man. They got UPS has to deliver the sun chain every morning down there. I mean that place is in the middle of nowhere. Okay. I'm telling you. It is hot <coughs> and in the middle of nowhere. Okay. It is in nowhere, Florida. Okay. So you think those metal studs are being manufactured in Live Oak, Florida? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Where are they coming out of? At best Jacksonville. Maybe Tallahassee. Okay. More than likely they're coming out of I should take a truck to drive from Capital Materials to Live Oak, Florida. We got specialty construction. I guarantee they're not getting it from you know, local. They're going to get it from up here. So they can put it on the truck. The truck goes down there. The truck driver stops at the truck stop. He decides to get drunk. Okay. He goes, runs off, ends up in Sylvester, Georgia. They have to get another truck. Okay. So stay ahead. Stay ahead on your procurement. Got a question for you. Is it okay to tell the sub you're going to start before you're going to start? Yeah. Yeah, it is. Because if you know they're going to delay you, if you tell, if you, once you learn your sub, you say, I need you on Monday, and they always show up on Wednesday. You start telling them you need them with the Monday before. Okay, that's not a lie. Okay, you're just communicating. You see the difference? You're communicating. It's like you have any relatives that show up late for everything. I do. Okay. I got a relative that'll be a half hour late to everything. So whenever we send them an invitation, we get them a special invitation a half hour early. <laughs> okay. That way we get them to the, to the party on time. Okay. There's nothing wrong with understanding the cat you're dealing with. Okay. You get them there. Your goal is to be sure that when your day hits that early start, it starts. Okay. Now let's talk about float. How much float is there in the roof curves? Nine days. Nine days. Very good. How much float is there in the roof box? Seven. 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 Okay. These all have to be done by 1010, right? That's late finish. Late finish. Okay. So we know that this could potentially start when? 10 7. This could potentially start when? Okay. Who else are you going to be calling? You'll be calling a roofer. You might be calling a roofer a month ahead of them. When are you going to have the roof insulation on the job? When are you going to have your product on the job? Okay. Because he's our critical path. Hopefully, by the time you get that steel erection up, you got the insulation sitting in your front yard ready to go on. It may not be. It doesn't make any difference. I'd, I'd prefer it for it not to sit in the front yard. Okay, like for it to come off the truck and go up on the roof in a perfect world. But because it's your critical path, it becomes your focus. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Do you see how your schedule helps you with that? Is everybody seeing that? Okay, now. Uh, this is an ancient device. 
It's called Roadmap. We don't use these anymore. Who had that? Mr. Del Rose. Oh, yeah. You can see he's used it a whole lot. <laughs> what have you been doing with this? I'm not sure I want to open this up. When you were in the middle of nowhere, you got no signal. Those yeah, are all right here. It is. So, and then if it gets wet, that's what happens. All right, so what is this? <laughs> What does the map do? This is directions. Okay? This, this is a form of schedule. Form of schedule. Now, are schedules flexible? Yes. yes. Yeah. Schedules really, if you think about it, are theoretical. Okay? They are flexible to a point when you're not on the critical path. Okay? They are subject to logic errors. They are a human invention. But schedules will, you will never get the perfect schedule on the job, okay? I don't care who produces the schedule. You can hire a schedule, it costs you $10,000 a schedule. You're not going to do a perfect schedule, okay? But what it does do is it gives you a roadmap to know where you're going, okay? Let's go through an example. I'm the superintendent on the job. Project manager says, you need to get the steel record. I get the steel record. I'm not thinking ahead. I'm not thinking ahead at all. So the next thing I got to do is what? Get the metal stud guy down there, right? Now, if I didn't have a schedule, didn't know what I was doing, my schedule is going to help me to anticipate where I need to be making phone calls, where I need to be scheduling things ahead of time. Because I can't call my metal stud guy on Saturday at 1030 and expect him to be there on Monday, can I? That's not reasonable. It's not reasonable. It's not reality. So as you look ahead on your schedule, you look ahead several weeks. It helps you to anticipate where your problems are. Little rule of thumb. Little rule of thumb. The office, project manager, executive chart, should give you the overall schedule. Okay? And they should help you manage that job on a month-to-month -month basis or longer, okay? Superintendent is 100% responsibility for a two-week look ahead, maybe a three-week look ahead. You understand what I'm saying? If you're depending on your project manager to schedule your job more than two weeks, less than two weeks, that ain't good, okay? You've lost control as a superintendent. You've lost respect as a sub. So the superintendent, in being in charge of the job, must have a rapport and a communication skill set with the subs so that they understand credibility and the subs will show up when they're supposed to. Okay? So own that schedule. Own that schedule. Own your two week look ahead 100%. Am I making sense? Yes. Okay. If you do that, the job will run better. Okay? Now, if I wait until I need it to call, what have I done? I've created a delay. Okay? Alright. So now we got a roof on the building. Right? What's the next thing we want to do on the job? Has the roof been there? Oh yeah. Oh, there you go. He got he just got that done. Okay, what can you be doing while the roof's going on? You'd be working inside because he's so, putting the roof yeah. on to see it weathered in. You, you could be working on fine grading for slabs, or actually pouring slabs. In some, on some jobs, you could start with your block fill on the back of the wall. Okay. On some jobs, you could actually begin your exterior finishes. If you have drive it or uh, stucco or things of that nature that are not impacted by water getting into them, you could do that. So then you begin the finish phase. Okay. And once again. The same technique applies. The same technique applies. Procurement. What do I need? Has it been procured? Does everybody have all their questions answered? Okay. I finish my roof. I've got to get my finishes on the outside. I've got to get my slabs poured. I've got to get the storefront in. I've got to get sidewalks in. Okay. We're walking through. I've gone about as far on this job as I want to go, but we can take it all the way to the end if you guys want. Do 
you some more examples. Tell me what you want to do. Some more examples. Yeah. Do I keep going? Yeah. Okay. All right. You asked for it. Okay. All righty. We're still on this section here on the front. Okay, because invariably on small shops, if we're going to start out, let's see, and this activity here is roof complete, okay? Now okay, roof is complete, and we're going to go through exterior finishes. All right, take a look at section two. What's the front of this building made up? What are, we, what are we putting on the front of the building? Evens. Evens. Okay. What else we got on there? Let's look over at section three, which is another section on the front. What do we got? Brick. Any flashings on that thing? Yeah. yeah any electrical? <clears throat> Junction box. Yeah. Okay, what else? Sign. Sign. Sign box. Yeah. Okay. So let's go through a logical sequence of what we've got to do, okay? When we look at this, we see the roof, it goes up, it goes to a parapet, right? So do I have to build anything into those walls? I've probably already built my electrical junction boxes in, but I got a sheet in the front of that wall, don't I? Okay, so my first activity is going to be what? Sheathing. Okay, then what is my next activity? Once that sheathing is up, what can I do? Do masonry, right? I can do EFAs. And at the bottom of that masonry, did they show a, uh, a base flashing or a, a whip grain or anything in there? Third wall flashing. Yep, there you go. We've got a flashing gear which actually goes ahead of this. Okay? Everything okay? Yeah. Okay, if you need to, if you need to do something. Oh, no. I, I just had to make sure that they those. Uh, that's good. That's it's right. a job site. <laughs> yeah, I understand. But I'm just saying that. Yeah, it's handy. Yeah, we're good. So, we know that our sheathing that's critical path. is here, right? Now, until I complete my sheathing, can I do flashing, masonry, or ethos? No. No. So, I'm going to drop out of this activity. I'm going to come back like this because of board space. And i got to do flashing. Okay. Once my flashing is in, I can then begin two activities, can I? Mm -hmm. I can be begin masonry, and I can begin brick. And if you analyze the time between those two, okay, either masonry or ephus will become my critical path, right? And we've got front wall to work on, and on this particular set of planes, you've got rear wall to work we got another activity that can go on down here once the roof is complete, and that's called exterior block paint. Rear of the building's painted block. Okay? The only thing that thing requires to be done is a roof beyond the build. Okay? So you can paint the back wall, at least get block fill on it, keep water out. Don't have anything to do with sheathing on the front, does it? They're not related activities. Does that make sense? Okay. So, sheathing, flashing, masonry, block are all related activities. Okay. One, hat, one is dependent upon the other. Okay. What is that painting dependent on? The, block. the, the right. block's already up because that was previously in our schedule, right? We completed that activity. We've done our blocking and so forth. So we come down. I gotta have the back wall done, I gotta have the roofing done, sheet metal on. Ah, now I can do that. You see? Walking through, taking a walk in the park. 
So I finished my masonry and I finished my brick. What can I then do on the job, on this front canopy? Ephesus is in. I can hang that canopy, can I? Yeah. And that top thing, what is this? Standing seam metal roof. Metal roof. <laughs> I can probably do that too. Okay. That's really more dependent. We could actually come down here, we could say, hmm, standing seam <coughs> at parapet. Now, as a practical side and quality and assurance, you're probably not going to do that metal. That eyebrow with ephus wet trade such as ephus or stucco or block working because of slap slop crap all over it. Okay. So you may make a, a judgment call in your schedule to move that further until after that activity. Okay? We good? Yeah, move your for clarification what ephus is. Okay, ephus is a, basically it's a synthetic stucco. Okay. Uh, Stucco goes back, once you get into antiquity, it's a cement sand mix. Sometimes they use lime putty in it, depending on what's available, okay? And it is basically a cementous, small aggregate material that is applied to a surface, stucco, okay? Is that rough stuff? Yeah, it can be, but it can be smooth, okay? If you go, if you ever get a chance to go to Italy or something like that, you'll see frescoes on the walls, ancient frescoes, and they would put stucco on the wall and then they paint it. If you look at uh, a lot of construction, if you ever go down to Mexico, you see the, uh, the, the homes there with the, the, the brown or the tan, kind of an adobe look, that's stucco, okay? It's a fairly simple problem. Now, in modern times, what they've done to get energy efficiency, they create a product known as EFIS, okay, which is a trade name, uh, but everybody just calls it EFIS. It's energy insulated finish system or something, Something like that. It stands for something. Um, but exterior, exterior insulated finish system, EIFS, an exterior insulated finish system. So what they do is they take polystyrene. Well, today that, oh, you know something, we left something out. Thank you. Um, is there anything here on having a, a water barrier behind that EFAS? Yeah. Gosh, we left that off the schedule, didn't we? Oops. Flashing ice and water shield. Thank you for picking up on that. Okay? I got to put up the flashing ice and water shield. Both those are they're not related to parallel activities. Okay, got to do that before we can start eat this whole break, okay? That is why. Something to keep water from getting in the bill. Okay. <clears throat> Let me ask a question. Uh, anybody here live in a house that has brick on the outside? Anybody here live in a house that's got stucco or ephus on the outside of it? Okay. And so the when, when ephus first came out, it was advertised as something that, you know, was a cure-all for everything. Sure. You can do anything with it. So you could you could build an igloo out of it. Well they found out that the stuff over time, water penetrates it. And water will get behind it, and when water gets into a building, it begins to disintegrate the building. And so they figured out that they had to put a weatherproof barrier behind the ephus so that it would have good longevity. So you will now see what's called an ice and water shield, which can either be fluid applied or solid. Depends on the product you respect. But that's got to go on. Okay? So, did I answer your question? Okay. Good. So, we got that up. That's done. Okay, we come down here, get our standing seam, we get our canopies up. And we can do storefront. Okay. What do we need to have in to do the storefront? Okay, here's our storefront. What's at the top of the storefront? Steel beam. That steel beam's already there, isn't it? Yes. Okay. Now what does it support on? Turn down slab, right? See down at the bottom of that thing looks like a hook going down the bottom? Okay, so if I don't have that in place, I've got nothing to rest my storefront on. Okay, now I don't want to put my storefront in ahead of the overhead work because of damage, damage quality control. Okay, 
So we're going we, we can we're going to move that back you know, further out in the schedule so all the overhead work is done. So when we go through this thing, okay, got our sheathing up, we did our flashing, we did our ice and water shield, we did our masonry and brick, we did our EFAS, we did our brick, we came back and did our standing seam, we did our canopies, and now we're putting in the storefront. Now, while we were putting the roof on the building, what were we also doing? Lisa, you know you answered this question before. Four slides. Okay. So we're going to come down here and we're going to say something like slabs complete. Okay. Now when did the slabs really need to be complete? After all your underground stuff. Yeah, that, that, but I've said that's early start, late start. What's your, what's your latest finish you can have on your interior slabs? What does the interior slab hold up? Fixture. Rope. Storefront. <clears throat> and your interior metal studs. <clears throat> Finishes inside your building. Once this roof is complete, not only are you going to be working on the outside of the building doing the sheathing, you're going to come over here and you're going to have the interior work, right? Mm -hmm. What is that interior work? What's the first thing you do? You got to do overhead rough, right? You have duct work, right? Mm -hmm. okay. Refrigeration. Refrigeration, you're going to have conduit, whatever is overhead, you're going to do that first. Okay. Your slabs in place and then you have to put in your partition walls. Those walls have got to be roughed. Okay. Sheetrock's got to be hung, it's got to be finished. What keys that activity? Roof complete, slab complete in a given area. So once again, you'll notice the schedule will get really, really thick. There'll be a lot of activities going on at the same time. So you got your interior work stream going here, your exterior work going here. We come down to storefront. And your storefront basically, your electrical will parallel, your electrical roughs are in. And we aim, once we get to that point, to what? Turning on the electricity in the water. Permanent electricity or permanent power. Okay? Are we up to speed up to here? Okay. Do you see how to relate the plans back to the schedule? Okay. Let's go through one more flow example. What's in the overhead rug? HVAC. HVAC. Electrical. Electrical. Refrigeration. Refrigeration. RFG. <coughs> Sprinklers. Sprinklers. Okay, and I will make an argument that you could have overhead support for any other number. Okay, let's say you had a projector you had to hang, you might have overhead support to put in the track for the uh, pharmacy grill. Mm -hmm. Let's call that overhead support. Okay? How long is it going to take the HVAC rough? A couple of days. Yeah, let's get into it. How about your refrigeration? Sprinklers. Maybe. Overhead support. Anybody ever use them? Yeah. Okay. All right. Joe. Jeff. <laughs> Jeff Palmer. Okay. Still on his own. Married a sprinkler. I called him up. I said, Jeff, I 
I'm not happy with the progress on the job. You need some more people out here. Let's get this thing done. He says, well, man, I've got three crews out there. I said, Jeff, you have three people out there. He says, that's what I said. i got three crews out there. That'll work, Jeff. Okay. So, I lost my date. We were through with the roof on 1010. Is that what we said? Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yes. All right. So, if this is 1010, what's our critical path? Overhead support. Overhead support. 1015. How much float? Three. How much float? How much float? There you go. Does that make sense? All right, so once again, buildings are poured. Let's go back to what we've done. Laid the building out. Our footings are poured. Our underslab roughs, roughs are done. Our walls are up. Make sure you make sure you load your walls are up. Our seat frame is in place. Roof curbs are on. Roof nailers are on. Roofs on the building. Exterior finishes are on the bill. We poured the slab. Interior roughs are going on. Storefront's going in. Okay. Once that storefront is in, or prior to the store, we get our sidewalk in. What's next? Curves and walls. Okay, right here you've got walls. Okay, now let's talk about walls. You know, stack a line on the slab, right? You know, lay out. Metal set and drywall. Okay. You want to put your track down. Okay. <coughs> you going to start framing. I see you. Right? Now, let's say walls, let's say framing. Now, what goes in those walls? Electrical, plumbing, plumbing electrical. Data, if you have data, if you could have data cables. Insulation. Insulation. Well, that, you got a frame. It oh. depends on the partition. Yeah. Yeah. Blocking. Yeah. Okay. You get all that done. Get an inspection, right? And then what do you do? Drywall. Drywall and finish. Once you do drywall and finish, you have paint. Paint and other finishes. Now, once you start framing that wall, what's some procurement issues you need or procurement items you need to be able to do the walls? Studs, studs. Doors, <coughs> door frames. Okay. You may have welded door frames that need to build in the wall. They may not be knocked down door frames. It may be welded, so you've got to build them in the wall. So you have wall building items. Now, what could go on at the same time walls are being framed? Well, your electrician can be running his primary service or his secondary service in the building. He says, why are we on the outside of the building? Right? Run gas piping. Okay. Okay. Conduit and so forth. Where are they going to be in the schedule? What's holding that activity from starting? Roof drying slabs. Okay. Gas piping is going to be run on the roof. Once that roof is done, he can start running that. Okay? So once again, you take each of your activities. So we got our wall framing done. Okay? What's our critical path? We'll ask a question. Wall framing takes 15 days. Plumbing takes 20 days. Electrician takes 25 days. Data takes five. Blocking takes two. Electrical. This is 1015. Okay. 25 days. 25 days takes you up to 11, 9. Is that right? Takes you up to 11, 9. We know that for early start and early finish and late start, late finish are the same. That's critical path. We know it runs through the electrician. Got some float here. Everybody see that? You do drywall and finishing. Same time you do drywall, gets drywall to a certain point, you can do what? Hang ceilings. Right. And then we have here at the end, we got finish and trim. Okay. 
So take a look at your schedule. How long was it taking us to build this group of shops? How long did it take us to start and get the footings in? Anybody write that down? Putting the basement. How many days do we have on putting the footings in? Ten days. What day did we start this job? Nine. Nine one, wasn't it? Did anybody take any notes here? I'm starting to get disturbed. <laughs> okay, so nine one is we start on nine one. Hey, I have nine fifteen. Well, be. Okay, let's start at nine fifteen. There's one in there, so. Okay, whatever you want to do. Okay. So how long did it take to go from puddings to start the measure? That was like nine, nine days, ten days? Ten days. Ten, ten days? days? Okay, so that took us to nine twenty five. How long do we say it's going to take to do the masonry? Right. Did we even say that? I don't think we. All right. Just for the sake of conversation, let's say it takes 20 days. 20 days on masonry. Now, right, let's go 15. Easier. Easier man. Masonry takes us to 1010. Then we, I think we said we were going to take, we put sheathing and metal stud and so forth up. It was going to take another 10 or 15 days. That was our critical patch. We remember that? Mm -hmm. Let's just say 15 days. That takes us up to 1025. Right? Right. Okay, 1025, we're sheathed out, okay, and we're ready to roof. We said that roofing was going to take five days, so that takes us to 1030. Okay? Our next critical path was not EFAS, was it? It was, metal, it was electrical. 25 days was electrical. That's a critical path. So that takes us up to 1125 for electrical. Everything else pulls along with it. Then we had finishes, which I don't even think we put time on, but just for the sake of our example here, let's say that takes another 15 days. 12. 14. Nope. No, 12, 9. 